we need to stop and think about what a true Christian is. What is a true Christian? A true Christian is one who abides in him and he abides in this Christian. God dwells in him and this Christian dwells in God. And that the Holy Spirit has been given to that person. That's what a Christian is all about. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul. Worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to reign. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Let's bless Him. Oh, bless the Lord. On John 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. It's basically saying that if you love, then you must have the spirit and uh, and if you have the spirit you know that you abide in him and he abides in you there are three things that are spoken here in this very short verse but three things are said here basically he's saying this first of all he speaks about the nature of the christian life that is something that is very clearly evident here. What is the Christian life? What is the nature of Christian life? Now, many people have a basic misunderstanding about what the Christian life is. But most people think that Christian life is where you have left two or three uh, very sinful habits. They always point out to a couple of sinful habits. They say, I've left these habits. I've not taken it up. I've not done it. And uh, now I'm going to church every Sunday. Basically, Christian life is interpreted like that. That's what they think Christian life is all about. Now, it's good that people leave certain bad things that they've been doing and practicing, and good that people go to church. But Christian life 
is something different. What is the Christian life? The Christian life is one in which you abide in him and he in you because he has given you of his spirit. Christian life is where you, one has received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come into that person. So you cannot understand Christian life any other way. The Christian life is where a person who was without the spirit before now has received the spirit. Now you can say that he abides in him and the believer abides in him and the spirit of God uh, abides in the believer. Now, we need to understand Christian life in that way. Let's look at it from many angles because there is a misunderstanding about what basic Christian life is all about. What is the Christian life? Some people think it's basically a moral living. Just being good and being decent. That's what a Christian is. A Christian ought to be good and decent and that's what Christian life is. Good and decent and being moral is important. But the thing is, that is not what Christian life is. Now anybody would agree with me that Bible talks about living a decent, moral and good life and so on. But the Christian life is not just that. You cannot define Christian life like that. Christian life is not about just being moral and living decently and living a good life. Christian life is something more than that. Christian life is what the Bible says it is. It says, we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us by of his spirit. We cannot reduce Christianity into something of a moral life. Christian life is where a believer abides in him and he abides in the believer and the spirit of God has been given to the believer. That's what Christian life is. Some people say Christian life is holding on to certain high ideals. High ideals, once again, is part of Christian life. Christianity teaches high ideals. But the thing is, that is not what Christian life is. Christianity is the believer abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in the believer and the believer receiving of the Spirit of God, receiving the Holy Spirit. Similarly, Christianity, some people think, or Christian life, some people think is some kind of a religious conformity. You know that Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is a big difference between conformity and transformation. From, you know, it's, there's a big difference uh, between being conformed and to be, and, 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 and then being transformed. Christianity is about transformation, not conformity. Now, what is conformity? See, when a person is conformed to the world, he acts like the world, he lives like the world, and he does things like the world. A lot of people, you know, uh, live just like everybody lives. There is a conformity to the world. We want to conform to the world. We don't want to look like an oddball. We want to look like everybody looks. We want to act like everybody acts. We want to do things like everybody does. That's what religious, that's what conformity to the world is. Similarly, there is a religious conformity. Religious conformity is that we join a group, we join a church, we join a denomination, we conform to that religious group. And by conforming to that, we think that we have now become Christians, that, that we are Christians. That is only religious conformity. That is not Christian life. Religious conformity happens all the time, you see. For example, you drive a car here, you drive on the left side of the road here in India. When you go abroad to some European countries or to America, you have to drive on the right side of the road. I used to think to drive on the right side of the road all of a sudden is a very difficult thing because you've been driving on the left side of the road. Now to drive on the exact opposite side of the road is difficult, I thought. But one person told me, it's not difficult at all. You can drive left side or right side. It doesn't matter because most of driving is simply following some others who are driving already on the road. It's simply following other cars. So really when you come to think of it like that, it's not difficult at all. You know, you just follow those cars. It doesn't, you don't have to think in terms of whether you're on the left or the right side of the road. You're simply following others. You're just going along with others, simply driving along with others. 
very rarely when you happen to be on a road when there are no cars, then you might make a mistake trying to drive on the left side of the road, you know, when you have to drive on the right side of the road. Just by habit, you may just get onto the left side of the road, not realizing that it's wrong. But mostly driving is just going along with others. Now, life is like driving only, you know. Just go along with others. Have you ever seen the cows being taken for slaughter? At night time, when you see the cows being taken for slaughter, you'll see hundreds of cows being walked down the road. I used to see in Prasavaka being walked down the road. They all act like they know where they're going, you know. Some guy is coming right behind them, way far behind them, but all these cows just keep going like they know where they're going. And uh, actually, these cows that you see don't even think about it. If you ask that cow if it can talk, it'll tell you, I'm going this way because all other cows are going this way. There's a hundred other cows going right in front of me. I'm just going right behind those cows. They just follow one another. They just have this herd mentality. Now, in human terms, we call it mob mentality, societal norm, whatever we call it. We have that mentality as, everybody, as the, the way everybody goes, we go also. That's the way we do things. It's conformity. Now, religious conformity is, comes from that kind of mentality. We see others doing certain things and we follow the same things, same tradition, same everything. And uh, we think, therefore, that we are Christians because we do those things that a Christian is supposed to do or these things that are done in Christianity. We think this is how things work and we just follow uh, everybody. But uh, to be a Christian is not a matter of conformity. It is not a religious conformity. It is something totally different, you know. We don't just do things without thinking. We just don't do things like uh, everybody is doing without, any, without thinking anything about it. We need to stop and think about what a true Christian is. What is a true Christian? A true Christian is one who abides in him and he abides in this Christian. God dwells in him and this Christian dwells in God. And that the Holy Spirit has been given to that person. That's what a Christian is all about. Another thing that people think about is a Christian or Christian life, they think, is belief in a certain Christian message, you know, such as that Jesus is the Son of God. He came in the form of a human being in this world that he lived, did miracles, died on a cross, rose again on the third day, and then he ascended to the Father. He lives there at the right hand of God one day to return for us. These things they believe and sometimes it is confessed and it's all good and, and it's all the, conf the, the faith confession and all of that is done with a purpose, is given to us traditionally with a purpose so that we can really know what we believe. So we confess these things in the churches and so on. But when we confess it long enough, it just becomes a habit. We just say things. We just say things without even realize what we are saying. We just say things, but we never realize what we mean by them. Christian, Christian life is not simply a belief in a Christian message, a general Christian message that does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is that you abide in Christ and Christ abides in you. And that the Holy Spirit is given to you and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. That's what a Christian is. So verse 13 gives us a definition of what a Christian is. By this we know that we abide in him and that he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Secondly, verse 13 tells us that we may know and should know that we are in a relationship to God and that we possess that life. 
you know, we know and that we should know that we are in a relationship to God and that we possess that new life. You know, <laughs> the King James Version begins like this, hereby we know. There is a way to know. Some people say, how can you know that you are in him and he is in you? These are mysterious things. This is like here is a God that you have never seen, that you cannot see. How can you know that you are in him if you can't see him? How can you know that he is in you and you are in him? How can you know that you have the spirit of God? Because he's a God that you cannot see. The spirit cannot be seen. How can you know? Well, all of the New Testament teaching has much to do with conveying this truth, that we can know this, that we can know that we are in him, that he is in us. If you read Paul's epistles, you will find that more than 100 times the word or phrase in him, in Christ, is mentioned. If you just count it, you'll be amazed. More than 100 times the word in him and in Christ is mentioned. Why? It tells us that the, all of Paul's writings, he wrote about half of the New Testament, all of Paul's writings has to do with conveying this particular truth that you are in him that a Christian is someone that is in Christ and that Christ is in the believer and, uh, and that the believer is someone who has received the Holy Spirit and that is what makes, makes him a distinctly different person than the world, that the believer is in Christ and that is why that phrase in Christ is used so much in the New Testament. Even John is writing to let the people know that. If you don't believe that, just read 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. See, he's writing so that you may know. You may know that you have eternal life. So the, all of the New Testament teaching has to do with knowing that you have eternal life. I say this because some people say, how can you know? How can you know that you are in him and he is in you? These things are not known. I've even heard some people say, well, maybe Peter, John and Paul and all these people knew and they had this assurance and certainty that they are in Christ and all that. But how do we know? They are great men. But how do we know that we are in Christ, that he is in us and that we have the spirit and so on? These are things that are not seen. You cannot see this God. How can you know that he dwells in you and you dwell in him and all of these things? It's impossible to know for us ordinary people. But according to the New Testament, the whole purpose of the writing of these epistles by John, Paul and Peter and all of these people is to let us know that we are in him, that we are in Christ and that he is in us and that we are in him and that the spirit of God is given to us. Now think about it like this. See, to be an unbeliever means that a person is dead to uh, spiritual things. A person is unconcerned about spiritual things. Dead to spiritual things means that person has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with spiritual things, has no interest absolutely concerning spiritual things. That's what dead to spirit, uh, dead, uh, spiritually dead person means. A physically dead person cannot engage in any kind of physical activity. He cannot get up, he cannot walk, he cannot talk, he cannot eat, he cannot drink, he cannot see, he cannot hear, he's dead. Suppose a person has been beating his wife and terrorizing his children, they're all running and hiding from him whenever he comes into the house. When he's dead, nobody is afraid because he's dead. He cannot do anything anymore. He has no physical life in him because he's physically dead. He cannot have any physical activity. He is incapable of physical activity because he's physically dead. A spiritually dead person is incapable of knowing God. Is a person that does not know God, is incapable of knowing God, and uh, has nothing to do with God and, and does not have the knowledge of God. Now, 
such a person when he gets saved think about it like this that such a person who's been totally off from god spiritually dead when he comes to know god spiritually dead means he has never he has not been interested in spiritual things doesn't read the bible doesn't pray doesn't go to church just like a physically dead person does not carry on any physical activity he has not been carrying on any spiritual activity he's been dead spiritually such a person now gets saved what happens what happens when he gets saved he now begins to engage in spiritual activity because there is spiritual life in him he engages in spiritual activity now he reads the bible he goes to church he prays he's got a desire to know the things of god he goes after the things of god because he's got spiritual life now now let me ask you if that person if a person who was dead now receives life physically a physically dead person if he gets up and receives spiritual life now and he gets up will he not know that he's got spiritual life i mean will he not know that he's got physical life now physically dead person when he is risen from the dead will he not know that he has now received physical life will he say well who knows no lazarus was dead jesus called him out of the grave jesus said loose him let him go he was bound his physical body was tied up bound when they buried him jesus said loose him and let him go because he's now got life he's got to get up and go and when he was loosed would he have any doubt that he has received physical life i don't think so he was dead now he is alive if you ask him he'll say my god i know that i'm alive i know that i have physical life you know because he was so dead he knows now that he's got physical life similarly a person who's spiritually dead has nothing to do with god no desire for god no spiritual activity he was dead spiritually now if he re- received eternal life is he received spiritual spiritual life don't you think he knows now that he has life that he has been quickened with life i believe that he knows he knows that he has received life he knows that life has come into him because he was not like that before and now he is totally different he is spiritually alive alive unto god and the third thing is john tells us the way by which we may have this knowledge that we are in him and that he is in us and that the spirit of god is given to us there is a way by which we know how do we know he says because he has given us of his spirit he says how do you know that you are in christ and that christ is in you he says we know how he says by because he has given us of his spirit he has given us of his spirit now there are certain cer- uh, tests we may apply to ourselves in order that we may know that we have received that the holy spirit that it received the holy spirit how do you know that you have received the holy spirit how do you know that the spirit is in you there are certain tests let's go through those tests very simple everybody can know that you have received the spirit and when you have received the spirit when you know that you have received the spirit you know that you are in christ and that christ is in you Just clap our hands Sing the singing like a prayer, all right? Really meaning it. I'm here to meet with you. Come and meet with me. I'm here to find you. Feel yourself to me. As I wait, as I wait, you make me strong. As I long, as I long, draw me to your love. As I stand, as I stand, and sing your praise. You come, you come, and fill this place. Won't you come, won't you come, and fill this place. Everybody else, clap for me. I'm here to meet with you. 